When I saw this portable recorder on the flea market, I thought that paying 5 euros for it could be a good deal, because besides the recorder itself, I'm also getting an opportunity to make a quick repair video, hoping that I could get away with just replacing the belts and cleaning the electrical contacts and switches. The repair wasn't very different than what I expected, however, all in all, together with the recording and the editing, took longer than what I envisioned at that moment. Except the recorder and the leaked rechargeable batteries inside, the seller didn't have anything else from the set, which originally included a 5V power adapter and charger for the batteries, a small carrying bag and probably the schematic of the device, a practice which, as I remember, was common or even expected when buying consumer electronic devices in that time. The playback and the recording key buttons are at the top, along with the volume control and the battery low indicator. Actually, it looks like the recorder was intended to be held with the left hand, especially if you are interviewing someone outside in a noisy environment and you have to keep the internal microphone close to the speaker, or if in the same time you have to hold an external microphone with the right hand, so perhaps I should better say that these buttons are located on the left side. The pause switch and the tape counter are located on the front side and the speaker is on the back side. On this side we see the input for the charger, an output for headphones, an input for an external microphone and an input for turning the device on and off remotely. The battery compartment is located on the opposite side and it can be opened by pressing this key on the back. It is now clean because before the recording of this video I already removed the old leaked batteries and I cleaned it with white vinegar. Besides the cleaning I also plugged the recorder to an external power supply and I did a short playback test which, besides the other issues, clearly indicated that the drive belt is loose and degraded and needs replacement. So, to prepare for the repair, I already opened the recorder to check the drive belt size and to do a quick visual inspection. Having no doubt that the repair will be successful, I ordered a set of 10 belts with various sizes and I bought 4 new nickel metal hydrate rechargeable batteries. With the belts received and the batteries fully charged, I'm now ready to start with the repair. Let me just insert the batteries and I'll quickly show you the issues that I found so far. So, the take-up spindle is spinning, but there is a loud crackling noise upon the turn-on. For a device that is 40 years old and probably not used for a longer time, we can say that this type of crackling noise is even expected. Let's try one more time. In this attempt, it looked as if the recorder is not getting power at all, so at that moment I suspected that perhaps there is no proper contact between the battery compartment and the prongs inside the recorder. I also might have gone too far during the cleaning of one of the prongs when I attempted to clean it with sandpaper. Anyway, you can see that this time, if I press the battery compartment stronger, a proper electrical contact is established and the recorder turns on. The volume potentiometer is working properly and there is no crackling when I turn it up or down. Now I'll put a cassette in that contains YouTube audio library music and I'll try it again. So let's sum up the symptoms that we discovered so far. There is a crackling noise upon the turn-on. There is wow and flutter effect present during the playback. The playback speed is low, the sound diminishes, the volume is low even when it's set at the maximum. There is a loose power connection.
So what are the common causes of crackling noise and what could be the cause in this case? The crackling noise is typically caused by a poor or loose electrical connection somewhere in the signal path or to the speaker itself. Poor connection to the power source, it can be caused by an electrical component that has failed or has been failing and it can also be caused by electrical interference. The usual suspects from the first group are bad solder joints, the switches which normally build up corrosion and dirt and the volume, balance and the tone control potentiometers which also accumulate dirt onto their exposed resistive tracks which then prevents good contact between the wiper and the track. But given the age of this recorder it's also possible that the crackling is caused by a component that is failing and in this case the components that we should suspect most are the electrolytic capacitors. I'll provide an explanation for this later in the video. Now let's open the recorder and start investigating and resolving the problems one by one. So the back cover is now removed and we see the main board, the speaker, the motor and the flywheel. This small board here is the motor speed control board. We can see that the belt can be easily deflected. You may have also noticed that this resistor is burnt and needs replacement. There are some tape remains here as well. Now let's do a test with an open cover. So there is no doubt that the belt needs replacement. I'm doing this test again to demonstrate how it looks when the belt is loose while the motor is running. Jerky motion as in this case, belt slip off or problem starting are clear signs of a degraded belt. Now let's remove the belt. From the set of belts that I ordered I found these two belts to be the closest match to the original and now I'll try with one of them. I picked this one first because it had the same thickness as the original one but it seems to be too tense when mounted. Let's try the playback now. There is no wow and flutter now, but the playback speed is slowly decreasing, which normally shouldn't be the case, even if the battery voltage is slowly decreasing due to the discharging, because the changes in the power supply voltage should be regulated by the motor speed control circuit. But to isolate the real cause better, I'll do a test with an external power supply. So even with an external regulated power supply set at 5 volts, we are experiencing the same behavior. The motor speed is slowly decreasing. You don't see that now, but the current consumption is constantly over 200 milliamps, which seems to be too high for this device and it could be because the motor is overloaded with this belt. So let's try with the other belt. We can hear that with the second belt, which is a bit longer than the previous one, the playback is much better 
and there is no change of the playback speed. Also, with this belt, the current consumption dropped to 100 mA, which is much better than 200 mA of current in the previous case. That also is proof that the motor was overloaded with the previous belt. Next, I'll remove this cover to replace the burnt resistor. I already checked the schematic of the recorder and I confirmed that the value of this resistor should be 68 ohms. This resistor failed in such a way that its resistance dropped to approximately 9 ohms, which is much lower than the nominal value. From the schematic we can see that during the playback it's actually connected in parallel with the speaker, so due to its low resistance it created extra load for the output of the audio amplifier. I can only assume that it burned out when someone plugged the power supply into the headphones socket by mistake. Now I'll solder the new resistor onto the board and I'll try again. The new resistor is soldered onto the board. Now it's time to talk a little bit about the crackling sound. In this case, because there was no crackling at all when I was turning the volume potentiometer up and down during the playback, and I didn't find any suspicious solder joint during the initial visual inspection, I'll narrow down the search and focus first onto the switches around the speaker and those that are between the power source and the board. Just to clarify, at this moment I'm still not assuming that any of the following possible causes is the main or the only cause for the crackling sound. I just find this as a good opportunity to give a short lecture on this subject. This is a part of the schematic of this recorder and there we can see that the connection to the speaker can be affected in the following points. The contacts in the headphones output that disconnect the speaker when the headphones are plugged in, the muting switch SW4 and the switch marked with SWI4 that disconnect the speaker during the recording and the switch SWI6. Just as a reminder, although the speaker is disconnected during the recording to prevent the unwanted audio feedback, you can still hear the signal through headphones connected to the output. The switches SWI4 and SWI6 are actually part of the recording play switch, which is a 6-pole double-throw slide switch. This switch is mechanically coupled with the recording key button and changes its state depending on if this button is pressed or not. So, normally, if there are no headphones connected and if the device is in playback mode, all these switches should be closed with a contact resistance that is practically zero. But over time, due to corrosion, dirt or weakened contact pressure, this resistance increases and it fluctuates in a wide range of values at the moment when the contact should be established. As a result of that, the sound that we hear will crackle or cut out. A few words about the power switch and the other switches that are present in the power supply section of the circuit. Normally, if no remote switch is connected to the device, the power to the circuit is controlled just by the power switch, here marked as SW2. This switch closes when the play, fast forward or the rewind buttons are pressed down, otherwise it stays open. In the same time, if no plugs are inserted into the external power and the remote switch sockets, it is assumed that these two pairs of contacts are closed. But again, due to corrosion, dirt or a reduced tension of the springs, it can happen that these contacts do not close the circuit properly and that will affect the operation of the unit. Next, I removed the main board to access and clean the switches. To ease the board removal, I also had to temporarily unmount this transistor from the small heatsink element located here. 
Here we can see the counter belt. I probably have to replace it as well, but none of the belts from the set could fit well here. Also, since the counter is still working properly, I'll leave it as it is for now. So, to do the cleaning properly and without unsoldering the play record slide switch, as I've done in some cases in the past, I ordered a contact spray for cleaning of switches soldered onto the printed circuit boards. While waiting the spray to arrive, I attempted to clean the switches with cotton earbuds and rubbing alcohol. In the following shots you can see each of them individually. Finally, I'll check the state of the capacitors, for which I do not have great expectations. I must cut the story short here again and simply tell you that I ended up replacing all electrolytic capacitors. Why? Well, I first unsoldered just a couple of them and I did a quick capacitance test. Since the capacitance test gave unusually high values, as on this example, I suspected that that could be the case with the others, so I continued checking the rest of the capacitors. Many of them had values which were almost twice higher than the nominal value and some of them were two times lower. I then measured the leakage current of some of them, keeping them connected to a 5 to 6 volts power supply and some of the values that I got were even higher than 5 milliamps. The circuit and the theory behind this behavior could be a subject for a separate video, but in short, I can tell you that for these voltages and capacitance values, any value of the leakage current which is higher than several hundreds of microamps is abnormal. A high and fluctuating leakage current upon the turn-on can severely affect the circuit operation and biasing and it can cause crackling as an end audible effect. This could also explain why the crackling sounded, so to say, very similar regardless of how I connected the power source and regardless of whether the play button was already pressed or not during the testing. So, as I said, I ended up replacing 14 capacitors, because I didn't want to repeat this repair anytime soon. In the meantime the spray arrived, so now I'll repeat the cleaning again. Ok, I already put everything back and now I'm ready to show you the results of the repair. Since I had difficulties to return the transistor from the speed control circuit to its original location, I made a new small heatsink and I moved it to this side instead. Also, in absence of a cassette with a pre-recorded test tone for the tape speed adjustment, I had to do that by listening to several tracks that are copyrighted, so that part had to be done off camera. All seems well now. Now let's put the cover back and do a quick test of all the functions.
Test. Eden, two, three. Test. Testing. One, two, three. Test. Eden, two, three. Test. Testing. One, two, three. No maintenance of a cassette player is complete without cleaning the head and adjusting the head azimuth. On this recorder you can adjust the head azimuth from the front side by turning this azimuth adjusting screw while the tape is being played back. I'm recording this final paragraph onto a type 4 metal tape using the recorder that I just repaired and an external microphone connected to it. If you are still watching this video, then you are either really interested in repairs and electronics, or you were impatient and skipped directly to the end. Anyway, I hope that you learned something new from this video. Thank you for watching and goodbye.